covered up by mercy's hand. A better view from where you stand. The doorway to another land. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Let's open in prayer to begin the study tonight, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have tonight. You could be able to come before your throne. As you open up tonight's study in your word. Thank you for Romans. And his willingness to lead. And for another installment in basic Christianity in which we'll hear tonight. I ask your blessing upon him. And upon all of us in the study as well as he brings to us. And may you... Open up our hearts and minds to really understand and take note of um, what you would have to, us to 
learn tonight. In Christ's name, amen. And amen. Thank you, Vio. Please tell me that you can hear me, everyone. Simple why from someone. Hey, violinist hears me. Christ well, very good. Well, good evening. Happy Wednesday to you all. And I hope you all had a good day today. We will be continuing in uh, our basic Christianity teaching. And as you know, and as I know you know, this is a discussion and not a lecture. Please feel free to participate by contributing scriptures, ideas, and thoughts. And if you can stand it at all, please hold off on questions until the end, at which point I would prefer to, the, to answer them then, because I am a sucker for rabbit trails. So, having said that, let's begin, shall we? <clears throat> We are continuing in our series, Basic Christianity. Tonight, we're continuing in the review and examination of our Christian walk as a facet of basic Christianity. And we're going to continue our acrostic re review of the phrase, by growing in grace, in regard to our following in the steps of Christ. We have covered thus far the letters B and Y, and in the word growing, we reviewed and examined the letters G, R, O, W, and I. I applied the first I in the phrase to eight of Jesus' I am declarations. I introduce those declarations with Jesus' I am declaration in which he boldly identified himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses when he said before Abraham was, I am, found in John 8, 844. And then we reviewed and examined Jesus' seven traditional I am declarations, and they are as follows. <clears throat> Number one, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst, in John 6.35. Number two, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life from John 8, 12. Number three, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture, John 10, 9. Number four, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, John 10, 11. Number five, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me Though he may die, shall live. He shall live. Number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And finally, last week, we covered I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. From John 15, 1. Are there any questions or questions or comments about <clears throat> those eight I am statements? Anyone? Okay, I do want to make a correction. It was John 8, 58, 
where Jesus made the statement, um, before Abraham was, I am. It was John 8.58, and I apologize for that typo. <clears throat> Tonight we will review and examine the N in the word growing. The N stands for nothing held back. We read in Jesus' words in Mark 8, 34 and 35, whoever, whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the Gospels, the same shall save it. Good evening, Dawn. Just getting started, so you'll be hearing the vast majority of tonight's lesson. Glad to have you with us. So, of those two verses... Sermon Bible tells us number one such were the terms by which Jesus Christ sought to enlist men in his service they came around him attracted by his holiness and curious to know more about him he offered them three attractions self-denial shame, and absolute surrender, unless they were content with these, they could not enter his army. And we have almost lost sight of the strangeness of the summons. Take up the cross has become a religious phrase. We use it almost mechanically. Today, when we're the most reverent, we almost hesitate to apply it to the trials of common life. We shrink from applying it to the man of the world, to the man of business, to the man of cultivated intellect. And perhaps it seems to be peculiarly strained if it applied to the very young. And yet it contains the very lesson of Christianity. Number two, to take up the cross daily is to be prepared for what is most painful in the attempt to your duty, to do your duty. The cross, like all burdens, heavy, exhausting, crushing, but it's more. It's degrading also. It fills us with shame. It crushes us. It crushes out of us our pride. And all that is false in our darling self-esteem. False in our darling, darling self-esteem. It makes us think less well of our energies at the very time that it taxes them most severely. It says to us, you must dare to face this duty. And in the same breath, how poor and cowardly you must be to dread it. Some crosses are visible. They're born, if born at all, in the sight of others. With strong natures, pride sometimes comes to the help of conscience and insidiously lends its strong arm to the support of the burden. But there are other kinds of crosses. There are those which no one ever sees, perhaps never suspects, these are not the least formidable. There is, number one, the cross of truthfulness. <clears throat> number 
two, the cross of self-denial in little things. Number three, the cross of humility. Number four, the cross of temperance. Each heart has its own cross to bear. To many, it is the burden of holding fast by God and leading a cheerful, happy life in the absence of human sympathy. To be willing to take up the cross is the very essence of faith of the is the very essence of the faith of Christ. By this test, he may measure. Sorry, I lost my place. We may measure our own progress. No laxity in our practice can ever explain away the declaration of our Master, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. That was from a sermon by H. M. Butler, a book called Harrow Sermons, second series. Another sermon from the Sermon Bible on these verses is this. When Christ is preached in our day, men are not ashamed of him on precisely the same grounds that they were in the early days. Christ is represented by great churches that are emblazoned with art, represent the wealth of the communities, that have about them a kind of historical charm, a flavor antiquity, and men are not ashamed of Christ as of old, nor are they likely to be. And neither are men ashamed of Christ doctrinally. Whichever platform you put, a, put, him, put him upon, whether you regard him simply as a man or of genius or as a semi-divine or as God manifest in the flesh, there's nothing that should lead men to be ashamed of him. Look at the different ways in which men unconsciously to themselves are ashamed of Christ. <clears throat> We wonder there are a great many men who are more or less studious, more or less thoughtful, more or less uneasy. It's been so for several years. They've been satisfied that they have not been living right and that they ought to come to a higher form of religious development. And they hope that the time will come when they can do this. What is the reason they never take this step in advance and break out into that higher development? If you trace it, you find that oftentimes there's a sense of shame on their part. A man shrinks from letting the community know that he really is concerned about himself and he's kept, by, and he's kept back by what may be said and what may be thought. Number two, there are a great many men who are hoping that they are Christians. They stealthily snatch at prayer. They turn to the Word of God and read that and read that a good deal, but they're not willing that it should be known. They're trying to live Christian lives secretly. There's connected with this a good deal of the element of shame, either directly or by inference. Number three, we are growing old in this world. Things perish in the using. On everything in life is the mark of change. Spring comes out of winter and changes into summer. 
Summer, with its growth, moves into autumn. Autumn is swallowed up in the winding sheet of winter. So, of all things in human life, youth running towards manhood, manhood declining towards old age, and beyond old age, there is a life that grows broader and broader, brighter and brighter. <clears throat> After this life, all that encumbered men and bound them here shall be dropped away. It is a life of joy and glory, and to that men are invited, that they may become sons of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And what is there in that of which any man should be ashamed? What is there not in it which every man should leap Knowledge with gratitude. And yet, shame in those areas is real. It was from a sermon by H.W. Beecher in a volume called The Christian World Pulpit. The Christian, the uh, preacher's homiletically also has some insights to these verses. You read the necessity of self-denial. We ought to attach more than ordinary importance to this saving of our Lord because it is evident that he himself laid great stress on it. He had been conversing apart with his disciples and particularly with Peter and something that Peter said gave him occasion to insist on this truth. Jesus did not take this lightly at all. I dare say that neither should we. He, Jesus, would not, however, address it privately to him or to the small band of his immediate followers, but he summoned the multitude to attend to him, marking by this circumstance as strongly as possible the importance of what he was about to say. And I could picture him lifting up his voice to say it. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He enforced the same truth again and again. Besides in Mark's gospel, we also read it in Matthew 10.38 and Luke 14.27. And is not the declaration in itself calculated to arouse our attention? If we know there's anything without which we cannot be true followers of Christ, it surely ought to be well considered by us. Because the very life and salvation of our souls must depend on it. Let us, take the, let us then take earnest heed what Christ here says to us. Let us consider well what that is which he declares to be necessary in order to prove our claim to be his disciples. Or let us rest till we have this evidence that we belong to him. Till this seal, as it were, is visibly set upon us to mark us out as his disciples indeed. The text requires but few words by way of explanation. To deny oneself is to refuse indulgence to our desires, not to do what we would do naturally or wish to do, to put a restraint upon ourselves, withhold from from any of our appetites that which would gratify them, and to act differently in any case to what nature would incline us. <clears throat> and the preacher's homiletical continues with a really 
well done uh, breakdown <clears throat> of what self-denial is all about. Number one, self-denial is necessary in order that when we may prove our love and fidelity to Christ. Number one, a service which costs us nothing affords no very certain evidence of our attachment to anyone. Christ would have us give proof of our loyalty and attachment to him. He requires it of us as a positive duty to give up something, to make some sacrifice for him, to oppose our inclinations in some way or another, in order that we may ascertain whether indeed love to his name is as strong or is a strong and ruling principle within us. <clears throat> Number two, there are many who are well enough disposed to the religion of Christ till it prescribes this duty. They appear willingly to hear the scripture, to join in prayer, and to observe holy ordinances. And they will do many things which would seem to indicate an earnestness and zeal in the cause of Christ. But they draw back and called to the difficult exercise of self-denial. This is the value of a service which cautiously avoids all toil and difficulty. <clears throat> Where is the proof of our being sincere in the love of an object if we will encounter no hardship to attain it? We see men ready to practice much self-denial and to think little of it in any matter in which their hearts are not are engaged. Look, for example, at the man whose ambition is to prosper in business. What a life of self-denial is his. He labors even to weariness. Rises early, late takes rest, eats the bread of carefulness, denies his nature the rest that it needs, and refuses many enjoyments which he would be glad to partake. They would hinder him in the object that he has in view. Even the man of pleasure must, in the pursuit of his object, often use self-denial. <clears throat> And so for those people, self-denial is reasonable to, to follow. They do follow it. Some greater gain at the end. He must put a restraint on himself at times. Refuse a less pleasure for the present, however strongly he wish his, his however strongly his wishes may incline to it in order to obtain a greater one in prospect. Hey, even the customary civilities of society impose on us frequent self-denial. A man will often deny himself, will often refrain from doing what he would otherwise wish to do in order to observe the rules of good breeding and courtesy. If then, content in the pursuit of business or pleasure to deny ourselves, if we're willing and able to practice it in order that we may observe the decent courtesies of life and to be esteemed well-mannered in society, what must be said of us if we refuse to practice it for Christ's sake? If we can use self-denial on other occasions and for other purposes readily, I only feel it too irksome when called on to use it for the purpose of pleasing him. What must be said of us but that the love of God is not in us? Can there be any other conclusion? <clears throat> Number three. 
2. Self-denial is necessary to the due discharge of our duties. For many of these, we cannot perform except at the expense of denying ourselves. Number one, how can the rich relieve the poor as they ought? Or how can the poor as they ought befriend each other except they deny themselves for each other's sake? We must in part sacrifice our own ease. We must give up our own way. We must abridge our own enjoyments if we would do good to others according to the will of Christ. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul wrote, Bear ye one another's burdens. This is his law, and it's evident that we cannot pretend to fulfill it except we deny ourselves. Look not, saith the Apostle, every man on his own things. Every man also on the things of others. Then he adds, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, inasmuch as his divine conduct furnishes the best example of self-denying charity. <clears throat> Not a single day passes which will not furnish any occasions for this. Hey, not an hour's intercourse with our fellow men, but will afford us opportunities of denying ourselves. By giving up, for instance, our own wishes and yielding to the wishes of another. By taking the lowest room or choosing the least desirable lot. Securing the comfort or ease or honor of those about us at some sacrifice on our own part. Putting a restraint upon our feelings, imposing silence on our tongue, refusing it the license which it loves. Not allowing it to utter words that may do hurt. Not answering again. Not resent nor resenting wrong nor resisting evil. In a thousand ways which only a watchful conscience can discover. And which no one may be privy to but God himself. We may do what our Lord here commands us. <clears throat> Daily course under the most ordinary circumstances may become a course of virtuous self renunciation, a course of habitual obedience to the injunction in the text, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross <clears throat> and follow me. Number two, there are at the present day great efforts made by the church for the extension of the Lord's kingdom among men, for propagating both at home and abroad the gospel of the grace of God. These efforts cannot be sustained except by the free will offerings of Christians. They must be given up unless the members of the church liberally give of their substance <clears throat> for their support. These multiplying demands on Christians cannot possibly be answered unless they contrive in some way to lessen their personal expense. 
to spend less on self-indulgence, to save somewhat more by self-denial, then and not till then will the resources of the church be adequately replenished and means be supplied her sufficient for carrying on her great designs of training her own children in the service and worship of God and of preaching among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. <clears throat> And number three, self-denial is necessary for the purification of our minds. Greetings, web user. Number one, as we were born in sin, and our nature is consequently corrupt, it must be watched over, restrained and subdued. Our innate propensities are all on the side of evil, and if any of them gain the mastery over us, we're therefore brought into bondage to sin. <clears throat> the only way to prevent this to mortify these propensities, to deny them indulgence, to oppose them at their first rising, however earnest and important that they may be, and by an act of self-denial to put a restraint upon them. Will grows unruly if it, not be, if it be not crossed. The soul is weakened by self-indulgence. Faith languages when the senses are unceasingly gratified. The affections will not rise to the things above if we grant them unrestricted enjoyment of things on earth. <clears throat> Therefore, it is that a Christian should be watchful for opportunities of exercising self-control and not wait till his desires point to something absolutely unlawful. He should, for instance, take his ordinary meals occasions for doing so, learning to keep in check the lower appetites of his nature in the common matter of, of meat and drink. <coughs> he should observe the same in reference to dress, refusing indulgence to himself in things which might awaken vanity and stimulate strongly the lust of the eye. <clears throat> in many ways from which he will not receive the least taint of asceticism or do any rude violence to nature or obscure to himself the blessed truth that God giveth us all things richly to enjoy. He may deny himself and bring his desire under control. And number two, when the exercise of self-denial is spoken of, there naturally arises in the mind a repugnance to it on account of the difficulty of it and the pain which attends it. But let us not give way to this repugnance seeing the necessity of self-denial is so absolute. <clears throat> For one, the exercise is difficult, doubtless, very difficult. Think not that we are left to encounter the difficulty alone, to meet it in the feebleness of our own nature. No. God will give us his Holy Spirit if we ask him. And with his divine cooperation, we shall be able to do what otherwise would not only be difficult, but impossible. Number two, with, with regard to the pain of it, it is granted that it must be painful more or less or less so, always. 
very word implies it. But is not pain suffered for Christ and in his service better than ease secured by deserting him? Is not pain met, met with in the performance of duty more to be prized than the ease which is sought in the neglect of it? Is not pain endured in seeking the purification of our nature better a thousandfold than the indulgence which must, which must complete its debasement? Besides, the pain is momentary. The advantage that flows from it, ever, it from it is lasting. See Romans 8.13 about that. The faithful soldier and servant of Christ who manfully engages in this warfare shall hereafter share his Lord's triumph and enter into his rest. <clears throat> As we read in Revelation 3.21. And that was from G. Bellet. In the sermon he delivered. Finally tonight, I'd like to share with you Matthew, Matthew Henry's insights into these of these verses. He writes, Christ should engage us all to follow him, whatever it cost us, not only as they were confirmations of his mission, as they were explications of his design and the tendency of that grace which he came to bring, plainly intimating by his spirit, he would do that for our blind, deaf, lame, leprous, diseased, possessed souls. Which he did for the bodies of those, of those many who in those distresses applied themselves to him. What notice had been taken of the great flocking that there was to him for help in various cases. Now this is written that we may believe that he is the great physician of souls and may become his patients and submit to his regimen. And here he tells us upon what terms we may be admitted. And he called all the people to him to hear this who modestly stood at some distance when he was in private conversation with his disciples. <clears throat> this is that which all are concerned to know and consider if they expect Christ should heal their souls. One, must not be indulgent in the ease of the body. As we read in Mark 8, 34, whoever will come after me for spiritual cures, as these people do for bodily cures, let him deny himself and live a life of self-denial, mortification, and contempt of the world. Let him not pretend to be his own physician renounce all confidence in himself and his own righteousness and strength. <clears throat> and let him take up his cross, conforming himself to the pattern of a crucified Jesus and accommodating himself do the will of God in all the afflictions he lies under. And thus let him continue to follow me, as many of those did whom Christ healed. Those that will be Christ's patients must attend on him, 
converse with him, receive instruction and reproof from him as those did that followed him, and must resolve that they will never forsake him. <clears throat> Number two, they must not be solicitous. No, not for the life of the body. They cannot keep it without quitting Christ. See Mark 8.35 for that. Are we invited by the words and works of Christ to follow him? Let's sit down and count the cost. Whether we can prefer our advantages by Christ before life itself. <clears throat> Whether we can bear to think of losing our life for Christ's sake and the Gospels. The devil is drawing away disciples and servants after him. He conceals the worst of it, calls them only of the pleasure, but nothing of the peril of his service. He shall not surely die. But what there is of trouble and danger in the service of Christ, he tells of it, he tells us of it before. He tells us we shall suffer. Perhaps we shall die in the cause. <clears throat> And represents the discouragements not less but greater than commonly they prove that it may appear he deals, deals fairly with us and is not afraid that we should know the worst because the advantages of his service abundantly suffice to balance the discouragements if we will but impartially set the one over the over against the other <clears throat> in short number one we must not dread the loss of our lives provided it be in the cause of christ from mark eight thirty five. Whosoever will save his life, declining Christ and refusing to come to him, or by disowning and denying him after he has in profession come to him, he shall lose it, shall lose the comfort of his natural life, the root and fountain of his spiritual life, and all his hopes of eternal life. <clears throat> Such a bad bargain will he make for himself. Whosoever shall lose his life shall be truly willing to lose it, shall venture it, shall lay it down when he cannot keep it, Without denying Christ, he shall save it. He shall be an unspeakable gainer. For the loss of his life shall be made up to him in a better life. It is looked upon to be some kind of recompense to those who lose their lives in the service of their prince and country, to have their memories honored and their families provided for. But what is that to the recompense which Christ makes in eternal life to all that die for him? And for those of you who thought, I was just about to say it, and you would be correct.
concludes this evening's discussion. Basic Christianity, Part 44. I do greatly appreciate your attendance here tonight. As I always do, and I mean it quite sincerely, I hope I made it worth the price of admission for all of you. We're not quite done yet, ladies and gentlemen. I will now take the great pleasure in turning the floor over to violinist to favor us with a piece or two on the violin. Violinist, the floor is yours, my brother. Mm -hmm. 